live from LZ Bunker. This is Veterans Live Show. I'm your host, Ronnie Embrus. I served with the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam in 1967 and 1968. Tonight, we have a very special guest. He's a former guard of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Staff Sergeant Jay Davenport of the 101st Airborne Division. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is one of the most iconic sites in our nation's capital, created for the unidentifiable servicemen who died in various U.S. wars. We will speak with Sergeant Davenport in a few moments, but first I'd like to let you know that this program is brought to you by Fallen Ever Forgotten Vietnam Memorials in the USA. It is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Book, a tribute to those who never made it home from Vietnam. Visit FallenEverForgotten.com for more information or to purchase your copy. Okay, this date. June 9th, 1967, Operation Akron was conducted by the 1st Brigade, 9th Infantry Division, and 1st and 3rd Squadrons of the 11th Cav and the Armed 18th Division in Hat Jig. This date in the Vietnam War on June 9th, 1972, U.S. advisor Paul Van died in a helicopter crash in South Vietnam. Let's go to the photo segment. Okay, let's take that first photo. Cecil R. Ham Jr. sent in from Catherine Leroy, French photographer, airborne qualified. She jumped with the 173rd. She was 5'3, stayed in the jungle with the troops. Catherine was captured by the NVA. She took pictures for Life magazine. They released her once they realized she was press. She cussed, and editors asked her where she learned to cuss so bad. She said, from the United States Marines. Okay, there you go. Semper Fi. All right, Dean Mart Mertans. Myself in the front, very good PFC. One of the first airborne division, good. Uh, for seven months in 65 and 66 with A battery, second 320th artillery, one of the first airborne. Good unit, man. I was in a headquarters battery, the 320th. Okay, you were a replacement. Leo was there five months when I arrived. He was the best soldier and paratrooper and person I had ever served with. Oh, we became good friends. Boy, he's a long one. I think we went through everything that they threw at us, the Army and the VC, that was, and we made it home. Very good. Excellent. Okay, John William Murphy, an M113 from the 28th Regiment of the 9th Rock. That's Re Republic of Korea soldiers. West of Tuiwa, 1968. And that's it. Uh, next one, Cecil Ham Jr. Preparing for a mission in deep jungle wear, tiger stripes, and the sergeant showing how to apply camouflage even to the back of the neck. It was important to do it right. The enemy called us men with green faces as a nickname. Very good. Yeah, it's important to put the stuff on so you're not spotted. Okay. Cecil R. Ham Jr. again. Tigers were not all over Vietnam, but they were in our area in G Company. Rangers, American Division. They would stalk you during the day, but come in at night and grab a soldier to eat. We were warned by the Marine recon who were leaving. They lost some men to this. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, here's the card for tonight. Vietnam card. Imagine this, playing cards for Vietnam. What do we got here? Perils in the jungle. Okay. American soldiers in Vietnam quickly learned that one of the enemy's most deadly weapons was the booby trap. North Vietnamese booby traps were simple in design, but very deadly. Pungy pits were cam carefully camouflaged and fitted with poisonous wooden stakes. Bouncing Betty mines and tripwires attached to grenades were also were some of the other perils in the jungle. Amen to that. Yeah. All right. Welcome into the bunker, Sergeant Jay. Thanks, thanks. It's yeah, good Sergeant to see you again, Where's home? Where's uh, home? Well, Tennessee is home. I'm currently stationed at Fort Campbell, and oh, uh, right okay. outside, right outside the base. There you go. All right, welcome, uh, welcome into our into the bunker. There's a big time here. We met Jay on Memorial Day in D.C. He led the color guard and presented colors with the 101st Airborne Division wreath laying ceremony, and with that in mind. In the hospitality suite, we got talking to Jay about 
other things. And sure enough, he served with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Guard, Honor Guard. Is that the Honor Guard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it called Honor Guard? You know, you know, you can correct me. I'm an E5. <laughs> <laughs> You're E6. Okay. So now we recorded this interview. We're going to discuss the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And we're going to play the interview now. And then afterwards, we'll do a live Q&A with Mr. Davenport. So ask your questions below in the sec comment section. The interview is cut into three parts. Here is part one. Good afternoon. This is Veterans Live Show, live from Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. on Memorial Day. Today, we have a very special guest, Jay Davenport, who has served with the Honor Guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And that's what this story is going to be about. Good evening, Jay. How are you doing, sir? I'm Staff Sergeant Jay Davenport. Uh, I joined the Army in 2012, and uh, now I serve at Fort Campbell with the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, and now we're here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my time as a guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I am Sergeant Davenport of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, United States Army, Guard of Honor, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. In keeping with the dignity of this ceremony, it is requested that everyone remain silent and standing. Thank you. All right, Jay, please give us a brief history of the tomb. Okay. The Unknown Soldier. All right. So the the first soldier was buried at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier on uh, 11 November 1921, and that was the World War One Unknown. And so that was when they created the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And they did so because uh, actually other countries, our allies, were creating tombs of the Unknown Soldier for their troops. And so the U.S. Uh, thought it was fit that we do the same. So 11 November 1921... Uh, this year marks 100 years ago when that happened. And then uh, after that, the World War II and Korea War unknown soldiers were uh, actually interred on this day, 30 May in 1958, 63 years ago, right? If my math is correct. Right. On this day, 63 years ago, the World War II and Korea War unknown soldiers uh, were interred there. Uh, in 1984, the Vietnam unknown soldier was buried there at the tomb. But he was later identified in 1998. Uh, he was First Lieutenant Michael Blassie was his name. He was a fighter pilot with the Air Force. And after they identified him, they sent him back to his hometown, St. Louis, Missouri, and buried him there in the military cemetery there in St. Louis. So that's a brief history about the tomb. Uh, as far as the guards go, uh, the tomb was first guarded in 1925. And interestingly enough, that was actually civilians who guarded the tomb. And then in 1926, one year later, the Army thought it would be a good idea to post a guard there. So they did during cemetery hours. Then in 1937, on July 2nd at midnight, was the beginning of the 24-hour vigil. Uh, and so the tomb has been guarded every hour of every day since then on midnight, July 2nd, 1937. So the tomb of the unknown soldier really represents all the unknown soldiers uh, throughout history. So, not a lot of people know this, but in wars past, there, there were many, many uh, unknown soldiers. And definition of that is a fallen soldier's body that they cannot identify. So, and this is common in World War I, World War II, and Korea. Uh, fortunately, by the time the Vietnam War came around, they, they had gotten better with tracking soldiers. Uh, well, service members, I should say, all branches. Um, but there are many, many unknown soldiers. There are uh, over 4,000, I believe it's 4,700 unknown soldiers buried in Arlington National Cemetery alone. And many, many thousands more across the, the world even. Uh, so the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, it has one service member uh, from World War One, World War Two, and Korea, but they represent all the unknown soldiers throughout history. So it's really, man, it's a, it's a, it was a great honor to, to serve there. And uh, the tomb represents, it is a place for loved ones, next of kin of fallen service members 
who never made it back home, it's a place for them to visit. Because, you know, let's say you might have been a, a spouse of a World War II soldier who had who died overseas, and they might have never found their body. They may have not been able to identify it. So they don't have a place to go to visit their grave. So those types of people throughout history have come to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to visit what represents the grave of their next of kin. Satisfied in the exactly. The in heart. One more question would be, what's your most memorable moment as a guard? That's a that's a, a tough question because, of course, there, there were so many <laughs> memorable moments. I mean, it was a great job. So I served there uh, exactly three years from uh, August 2012 to August 2015 and during so during that time um, I had a lot of a lot of great moments but I will I will say one of them one of the the top ones that that, that comes to mind is um, I was actually uh, fortunate enough to to do a reflaying ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Arlington National Cemetery. So Arlington National Cemetery was formed in uh, June 15, 1864. So on June 15, 2014, uh, I participated in a ceremony, a reflaying ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to commemorate the cemetery and honor the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So that's definitely one of the, the top things on my list. Okay, what, what's the uh, routine of, a, a da say, a daily scheduling? Okay. And how, how many days between? Or gotcha. All right. It's a kind of a weird schedule. It's an old, uh, like, firefighter schedule. So the guards, they work 24 hours on, 24 off. So day on, day off, you do that three times, covering a six-day period. And then you get three days off. So the total schedule is, is nine days. Okay. Uh, as you're rotating throughout that, that guard shift, like I said, you got, you know, if, if a relief was full, you would have six soldiers. Um, in the summer, the summertime, like we are right now, they do 30 minute shifts while the cemetery is open. So if you rotated that between six guys, you know, you might be on, you might do 30 minutes on and then come down to the quarters and you might be off for a, Two hours, a hours, yeah, a couple hours. Yeah. Refit your uniform, shine your shoes, touch up your shoes if you need to. When the sun's out in the, the heat of the summer, that the sun really bakes your, your shoes, the, the, the polish on your shoes, right. makes them dull. So a lot of times you do 30 minute guard shift, come down, have to shine your shoes before you can go back up, that sort of thing. And so you do that, rotate out. Uh, and, and then after the cemetery closes at nighttime, uh, they guard uh, two hour shifts. Well, sometimes one hour shifts, depending on uh, different things, but generally two hour shifts throughout the night. Okay. Wow. Very informative, Jay. Is there anything uh, about that first part you'd like to mention, to clarify, or add to? Um, let's see. I can't really think of anything. Uh, do, you, do you have any questions yourself? No, pretty, uh, pretty. Pretty informative. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, my questions are asked. Uh, maybe just this one. Uh, is there anybody in there? Yeah. So the, you mean actually interred there? Correct. The body in the, in the white vault. Right. So the, the World War One, World War Two, and Korea unknown soldiers are still there. Um, I, I don't think anybody really knows uh, how much of them is there. Right. Because it could have it could have sure. only been uh, parts. Right. But yes, there are there are parts of human remains for each of those. Yes. That's great. Very symbolic. Yeah. The uh, Vietnam crypt is uh, empty because I, I I guess this is a good thing to mention. Uh, just came to me. Um, we didn't talk about in the in the video interview was uh, that there was only one unknown soldier from the Vietnam War. Uh, so once he was identified, luckily, you know, that's very fortunate that there was nobody to replace that that body. So he was the only he was the only body that we possessed that we could not identify. And uh, so since time has gone on, technology has improved, we are able to identify bodies as we find them, you know, because uh, for those who don't know, the United States still goes to these foreign countries where we uh, previously fought wars and they will find 
uh, they'll spend lots of time over there to track down uh, remains of fallen service members and they'll bring them back to the States and they're, they're able to identify them. So, uh, so that's great. So there's no, uh, unknown soldiers from the Vietnam war. So, yeah, we had a guest on actually who did that, who oh, went awesome. back to, to, to look for survivors from plane crashes, helicopter crashes, especially. Yeah. What was the other map? Remains. remains. Yeah. With the fine, they found some remains and with the DNA thing. Now it really, uh, in, Technology is enhanced so far. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. But, uh, yep. uh, okay, uh, let's go to roll the part two of the interview. All right. Yeah, interesting thing that I see there. Uh, one would be the inspection. Mm -hmm. It seems as though the sergeant or the lead commander talks about, oh, look, overlooks you guys, your back of your neck, your shave, your any lint on your jacket, your crease in your pants. And, right. What's up with that? <laughs> so that would be the the final. I was what we call the final inspection before that oncoming guard goes on duty. And the reason I say final inspection is because when uh, a soldier is uh, downstairs getting ready to go out for his guard shift, the the rest of the relief, including his NCOs and everyone, is looking at his uniform, uh, literally top to bottom. Like you said, any piece of lint, any uh, you know, string on the uniform, anything like that, they're inspecting him for, could be 10 minutes right. before he goes out the door. And really, that inspection that you see on the plaza that happens right before he, during the guard change, you're really looking for things that might have happened between the door the and the right. inspection block, right. which is only, I don't know, 50 feet or something, 60 feet maybe. But... You, you might be surprised. Sometimes it does happen where, you know, because you're walking under trees. I, I've seen, you know, things yeah. fall out of the tree onto a soldier's uniform. Or maybe there's a high wind and his hat gets blown crooked, something like that. So uh, that's the time that sergeant would fix that uniform right before he takes the takes his walk. All right. Who cleans the weapon? Who cleans the weapon? Uh, the <laughs> That's guards. That's always been inspected. Been right, right. Inspected. Yeah, the guards. So we, we we clean the weapons every single day. Right. Um, even though they're never fired. Yeah, even though they're never fired, they could not. They could. They might not have seen rain. Uh, they they weren't fired, but we we clean them every day. That's one of the daily routines. What inspired you to become a guard? That uh, that would that's kind of an interesting uh, interesting situation for myself because uh, so. I first visited Arlington and the tomb when I was 14 years old. And I already had a little bit of information about that because I had a family member, uh, my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, uh, was actually a tomb guard in 1957, 1958, a long time ago. When we visited the cemetery for his funeral in 2009, uh, I went and interacted with some of the guards and talked to them. And I would say it was at that point that I decided I wanted to be a tomb guard. I made it happen. That's what I wanted to do, so I, I, that's what I did. If you didn't inspire yourself to do that, or that, is, that inspiration came to you, how would somebody sort of apply or be nominated? Or how, that how do they How do they, be, how do yeah. they get to the tomb? Right. To, yeah, yeah, okay. When I was in basic training at Fort Benning, they had a recruiter from the old guard who, who was stationed down there to find guys and that recruiter is looking for uh infantrymen because that's the home of the infantry but also uh there there are of course other mos's uh support mos's in the regiment that they can also apply to be tomb guards so but for my case uh at fort benning i talked to the recruiter uh he's looking for three things he wants you to be taller than five foot ten and uh, has certain requirements for ASVAB, ASVAB scores. Back when I joined, it was uh, they looked at the GT score uh, of 110 or higher. It may have changed by now. But, uh, and then the third thing is, of course, PT tests. What's your PT test look like? And he looks at those three things. And if you volunteer, they'll put you on orders to the old guard. So that's what I did. Got to the old guard. Then uh, you have to volunteer and try out to be a tomb guard. So... Um, that was for me, I just went straight to the, to the Sergeant of the guard. And I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I, this is something I really want to do. Um, uh, I had a family member who was a tomb guard and, 
and he saw my motivation. He knew that, you know, that I had a passion for it. So he's like, well, we'll give you a shot. How many steps uh, back and forth are there? 21. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about yeah. that. Good question. Good question. Okay. So once the guard, the oncoming guard uh, takes the mat, we uh, that's what we call it, the black mat you see there. Uh, once he once he takes the mat, he's posted on duty. Uh, his This is his routine. So he'll stand on, on one side. He'll uh, walk 21 steps to the other. He'll turn and face DC and he'll pause for 21 seconds. Then he'll turn back down the mat, change shoulders. So the rifle is always facing the crowd, not the tomb. So he, the, all, the, all, the rifle is always on the side of the crowd. So he changes shoulders, pauses 21 seconds, and then continues, takes 21 more steps and continues that process during, during his guard shift. And how often does the steps take place? You mean the, the changing? No, the walking back and forth. He just continuously does that? Yeah, continuously, the whole time he's out there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And uh, how's the crowds? The crowds, uh, right. Do you have something get disrespectful? Or yeah. Just, um, what are, what's going on? Oh, I know one, one thing that uh, a lot of people might want to ask about is uh, when you see a tomb guard like yelling at the crowd or yelling at a person. I know there's a few videos, you know, floating around on the online of, of things like that. And people all people always ask me, uh, have you ever done that? And, and I'm like, yes, because they don't realize it actually happens quite often. And the most common offense would be people talking too loud. So when you walk up to the tomb, there's a sign that says silence and respect. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, you know, school groups, young kids who visit the cemetery, which is great. Um, but when you get a large group of kids together you know how it goes sometimes happens probably once a week at least uh but for the most part um the crowds that come to the tomb they know most of the time they know what it's about they know to be respectful and and they generally are great any real wild scenes ever outbursts by the crowd or um yes there there was there was a couple incidents um while i was there there was a couple incidents of note uh one time um I saw some visitors come up and they clearly did not speak English. I, they were believe, I believe they were speaking German and uh, they were speaking very loud. And so, and I had to yell at them and uh, they actually yelled back. I don't know what they said because I don't speak German, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they were cussing me out in German. So uh, uh, then luckily they just walked off. But I, what, in a situation like that, what the guard is going to do is... Um, He's going to call down to the office uh, and bring someone up, you know, no who's in. Yeah, exactly. The, the <laughs> enforcement. So uh, when you look at if you're standing uh, on the steps, looking at the tomb over to the left side, you'll see a, a green little tent looking thing. Right. In that that little tent, there's uh, really three things, a mirror, a phone and a bottle of water. So the mirror, you know, of course, if you need to look at your uniform, you can the guard can at any time. He can walk in that box to use any of those three things. And so he can look in the mirror, check his uniform. He can call down. It's a direct line to the office where the rest of the relief is, um, which is right below the Memorial Amphitheater. And uh, and then, of course, a bottle of water. Um, what he's doing with that bottle of water is that he's actually wetting his gloves to get a better grip on the rifle. So that's what that's, that's interesting. For. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, really good. All yeah. Right. Wow, that's amazing. Anything else you'd like to share with us that you might have missed or could add Yeah, I to do that? have a couple I would like to talk about um about a couple of the pictures that were rolling uh during the, while that was playing. So, uh there was two pictures that that were rolling of of myself at guarding the tomb wearing two different uniforms, one raincoat and an overcoat. So, I'd just like to take a minute and talk about the three different uniforms that you might see a tomb guard wearing. So um, the main uniform, of course, is the class A's, uh, the dress blues that you see. Uh, we call them ASUs now, the Army Service Uniform, because it's the official dress uniform of the Army now, the dress blues are. Uh, the other, the next one, uh, you'll see a picture that rolled. You can go back after this is archived, after, after it's um, done. But there's a picture of me wearing the raincoat. You'll see a picture 
uh, it, there's like a torrential downpour and, uh, there's a, you, you'll see me wearing that raincoat and then you'll see another picture of me in the snow wearing the overcoat. So the raincoat is like a trench coat. And then the overcoat that you see, um, is like a double breasted wool coat and you actually wear a scarf underneath that. And, and so the standard when I was there was, uh, I believe, uh, below 45 degrees. You wore that overcoat, um, with white gloves. And then if it was below 35 degrees, you wore black leather gloves. Gotcha. And then in the rain, you wore that, that raincoat with, uh, just the white gloves. But that, that one picture of me guarding the tomb in the, in the rain was pretty cool. It was another, um, memorial, um, memorable moment from my time while I was there because, uh, like I said, it was pouring down rain and, uh, I look over and, uh, I see a guy standing out there in the rain, taking pictures of the tomb. And, um, I remember thinking that was pretty cool of him, you know, everyone else, uh, when it started raining, they, they took off running to, towards shelter. Uh, but that guy, uh, stood out there in the rain and was taking pictures of the tomb. So after that shift was over and I'm talking about, it, it was pouring down rain. One of the hardest rains that I was in right after that shift was over, I came downstairs and I changed my clothes really fast into civilian clothes. And I went back upstairs to see if I could find that guy. And I saw him walking down the sidewalk. And so I went over there and stopped him. And, uh, it was kind of funny. He turned around and was kind of shocked because he's probably thinking, how did I get changed out of my uniform so fast? <laughs> but I said, uh, I was like, Hey, uh, I said, uh, I appreciate you standing out there in the rain with me, you know? And he said, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, he said, I love being here and all this kind of stuff. And I said, uh, I would love to have that picture if you wouldn't mind sending it to me. And he did it. The man, he lived in Maryland, not too far away, uh, from DC, but his name was Mike Lubecker. And I'm still, I'm friends with him on Facebook to this day. Cause, um, uh, he just really, uh, made an impact on me that day that he, uh, stood out there in the rain with me and was taking pictures of the tomb. I thought it was really cool of him. Yeah. Great. Under all conditions. Amen. Yep. This is really any, anything, any odds and ends that we get. Do we have Okay, we're going to go to the final segment with the interview with the former to Tomb Staff Sergeant Jay Davenport. Here we go. Q&A. Q &A after that. Yep. Right. Yep. After that, we're going to do the Q&A. Sounds good. Is this your Sentinel badge? Yeah. So, yeah, I'll talk a little bit okay. about that. Yeah. Um, so the, the formal name is the Guard Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Identification Badge. And uh, it's one of the fewest, uh, of the, one of the least awarded badges in the Army. And uh, it was created in 1958. So, like I mentioned before, there were tomb guards, military tomb guards, all the way back to 1926. But they didn't create a badge for the job until 1958. And uh, since 1958, there have been 688 of them awarded. And uh, that is a, an average of about 10 a year. Uh, and they're all numbered. Mine is number 612. Could the badge ever be taken away? Could you be revoked or lose your badge? Yes. So the Tomb Guard badges, uh, I believe the the only military badge that, that can be taken away from you, revoked, we should say, uh, for the rest of your life. And that what that means is That's amazing. when you get an award in the military, you get uh, orders for it. And basically what that means is uh, if they so choose, they can strip you of those orders like you never had it. So that has happened, and these and this is this is you know one of the things that uh, that it could be caused by. If you uh, got out of the service and one day you made some bad choices and you uh, got arrested for whatever reason, felony? Uh, no, it could be misdemeanor. Yes, really? Yeah. That, that, that low. Yeah. Then uh, you could get your badge revoked you could yeah wow. so unfortunately it's happened a few times something we're not really proud of but uh it has happened and it can happen and and uh so it keeps you know keeps you on your toes i guess stay out of trouble yeah, that's but they, the reason they they do that is um uh, uh, is because it would really bring discredit upon 
the tomb of the unknown soldier. Right. You know, so if you have a former guard, a former tomb guard who, uh, you know, made some bad choices, you know, got into some some legal trouble, whatever, then uh, you don't want that really staining the, staining the right. importance yes. of the tomb. Right. I would say. Sure. Yeah. So that's why they that's why they do it. Up, shoulder. Oh. My training is different for everyone, but my training at the tomb uh, took me seven months, which you go through a two week selection process to even begin training. Uh, once you pass that two week selection process, you may be there about two months before they'll let you go out and guard. Of course, uh, once they feel you're qualified enough to go out there and start the job. Uh, prior to that, you're going to be training at night. Uh, all, every time you're at work, at nighttime, you're always training uh, while, while you're in training. And so there's a series of tests that you complete. There's five of them. And they're all the same test. And it's uh, testing on uniforms, your knowledge, uh, your history. you got to memorize uh, 17 pages of history about the tomb, the cemetery, um, different things like that. And then the very last test is what we call the badge test. Once you complete that badge test, you're awarded the badge. So that whole process right there took me seven months. And uh, after you complete that, uh, the, the work is really just begun. Now you're a qualified sentinel at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and you know, you're expected to, to serve there, uh, the minimum would be nine months. I would do it again if, if needed to, you know, of course I would, I would, uh, I would serve again, but, um, it was such a, a highlight of my life that I don't think I could recreate it. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I closed that chapter and when a tomb guard leaves, when his service is done, they do a last walk ceremony. So it's the last, the last guard shift you'll ever complete at the tomb and so i did that on um let's see it was oh no august 31st 2015 was my last time i guarded the tomb that was my last walk and you do a rose lane ceremony at the end and uh so that's like the that's like closing the book you know what i mean yeah. so i closed that book that part of that chapter of my life and um uh, now it's great to just be able to to talk to people like you and your, your listeners who, who are interested in learning about the tomb, I, I love to, to give the history because uh, so many people are interested in the tomb guards and all of us tomb guards, we like to put the focus on the unknown soldiers. You know, we're there because of them. Um, and so that's what, that's what I like to do. I'll uh, talk to people and educate them. And, and I know that the tomb is being guarded right now. You know, the tomb is approximately a mile that way. And I know there's a guard there right now. And there'll be a guard there tonight when we're all asleep in bed. And uh, so I know the, the duty is covered. Now, the, uh, the weapons, uh, each everybody has their own individual weapon? No. So each, um, so let's see. Well, when I was there, there was about four of them, I guess. Four m 14 So the guard carries the M14. The... The, uh, the changer, the assistant relief commander or the relief commander, they carry now the M17, the new SIG firearm, uh, on their on their belt in a holster. So, but the guards, they carry the M14. Um, when I was there, each relief, they had their own stocks. You know the M14, you, you right. carry M14? Yeah. Okay, right, yeah. they come apart very easily. Right. So. When I was there, each relief had their own stocks. So when the new relief came on that day, you would take your stocks and put them on the rifles. Um, and those, so those stocks are like fully customized by the, the, the guards. So a standard M14 stock uh, has a pistol grip or, you know, cut into it. Right. So what we did was we shaved off that pistol grip and then shaved down the, the whole stock to make it just slimmer and sleeker and then sand it down for hours and stain it and you know coat it with polyurethane or different things like that a finish and uh so you put a lot of times into the stocks and unfortunately they don't really last that long because they get so beat up 
during the weapon inspection, during the while the guards out there changing shoulders, they get pretty beat up. I would say a set of stocks might last six six months or so, and you got to do it again. And it's the same for the bayonets. Actually, you see a bayonet on the end of the M14, and the the handles are wood. You, it's a M6 bayonet. Did you carry one of those? No, the, uh, yes. Well, right, right. That's what I was gonna okay. say. Is yeah. it's plastic right. is uh, what it came on there, and then uh, you know you'd find some uh, some guy in the in the platoon who's kind of uh, skilled with uh, wood, and that was me when I was there, and shaved down the it's a block of wood, shaving down, make it into a uh, a uh, handle, a wooden handle for those bayonets, and same thing, stain them, coat them, and slap them on there. And nice. they're beautiful, they're beautiful. Yeah. Nobody, you don't really get to see them up close, but if, if you see them, if you hold one, it's it's beautiful work. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, we got a QA session. And so send your questions or comments in, and we'll be able to answer them at the end of the show. Thank you very much. This is live from Veterans Live Show from Arlington Cemetery. Okay, wow. That was outstanding, Jay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Any, anything possible that you could add? I mean, I don't yeah. expect too much, but go ahead. Anything? Yeah. So uh, one point I'd like to drive home is education. I think every young person should know uh, the history and, and everything about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So if uh, anybody is looking for an extensive amount of information about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, they can visit tombguard.org. It's the uh, the website that's run by our association, the Society of the Honor Guard Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And that's tombguard.org. And you can find all kinds of history about the tomb itself and as, as well as the guards. So uh, uh, that and and one other thing I would like to mention is um, one, one question that I've seen asked a lot online is... Uh, what does the tomb guard do when they're done with their service at the tomb? So I'll talk about that a little bit. So it's the same as any other duty station in the army. You got two options. You can either reenlist and go somewhere else in the army, or you can get out. And, um, uh, when I was there, um, it was probably about half and half, about 50, 50 soldiers got out of the army and then uh, others like me re-enlisted uh, and went somewhere else. Um, you, you generally can't stay in that unit, just like any other unit in the Army. You generally can't stay longer than about four years. Probably three or four years is about average that someone would stay in the old guard. And then they'd have to, the Army would make a move somewhere else. So, so me, I, I chose... Uh, I got a choice of duty station when I re-enlisted to go to Fort Campbell. I chose Fort Campbell because it's uh, home, right yeah. on the Tennessee-Kentucky border. Right. So, uh, I re-enlisted uh, and came to Fort Campbell and then ended up staying at Fort Campbell for a long time. Um, I uh, reported to Fort Campbell in October of 2015, and then I did like one contract at Fort Campbell. And then when it came time to reenlist, I chose to, uh, uh, reenlist for stabilization, which means they leave you there for another two years, uh, minimum, or I think it was 18 months. I don't remember, but anyway, long story short, I've been at Fort Campbell now for, uh, coming up on six years this October. So, uh, during my time, uh, at, here at Fort Campbell, I did uh, my first four years. I was in a third brigade combat team, um, the first of the 187th Infantry Regiment. And uh, so uh, during that time, I deployed to Afghanistan uh, for nine months in uh, 2016 and then came back, was in the, that battalion for a couple more years. And then I volunteered to work for the 101st Airborne uh, division honor guard. And, uh, and that's where I work now. And that's, uh, and as you know, that's how, that's I met how we you. met. There yep. you go. <laughs> they sent me to DC for a Memorial day to lay a wreath at the 101st Memorial, which was an awesome experience. And that's when I met you and the rest of the crew. So, um, yeah. Uh, I, but anyway, back to the point, um, a lot of times soldiers will, uh, finish their, their guard duty, 
at the tomb of the unknown soldier and they'll go other places. I, I've got a lot of buddies who, uh, continued service and some of them did some, some awesome things. Um, there are some, uh, helicopter pilots in the army that are former tomb guards. There's lots of, um, there's lots of guys who were uh, tomb guards as an enlisted personnel and then decided to make the switch to officer and, uh, you know, through OCS or, or what have you different routes. I got a good friend who is a, an MP officer. Um, and he was once, a he was once a private at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And then who else I, I got, like I said, a couple helicopter pilot buddies. I got one buddy who, uh, is an army diver. Uh, that's his full-time job now. He's a diver. 12 Delta is the MOS. Um, so different things like that. And then, like I said, I've got a couple of buddies who, uh, just did their time at the tomb and, and, uh, and got out of the army, which is cool too. So yeah. You got anything else for me though? That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. You get, man, it's real. What an experience to, to, to have that quote unquote. Is there an MOS number to that, this position? Uh, no, sir. So, um, any MOS can do the job and, right. uh, okay. there's no, uh, there's no, uh, like a, a designator or anything for for the the job itself but while i served there at the tomb i served with um uh, a cook a mechanic what else there you uh, go couple, very neat very needy people we need those people <laughs> right right a couple of different medics which uh <laughs> there you go had, yeah i had a good buddy who was an army medic and he finished his time at the tomb, got out of the army, and now he's a nurse. So there, that goes to show you different things like that. Um, uh, and but it was interesting because uh, that was my, you know, my first duty station in the army. So I showed up there, and um, I'm an infantryman, uh, and I showed up there, and my very first team leader in the army was actually an MP because he just. He, he was a tomb guard there, happened to be a MP, and they stuck me, they stuck me in his team. Uh, great NCO, great guy. But uh, there you go. yeah, it's a really cool experience because okay. you, you know get to work with some different MOSs like that. So, all right, we're gonna ready to go to the question and answer session. Yeah, what do we got rolling in? Any questions? Okay. Okay. First question or comment. Kilo nine, oh, very informative, good stuff. Thumbs up. There you go. Thank you, Kilo nineteen. Yeah, education. Yeah. I'm all about educating people about the tomb of the unknown soldier. I appreciate the shout out. Really? When, when did, did you first, first from visit. Zeke or Bleak? When did you visit the tomb? First visit the tomb of the unknown soldier. All right. So I was a uh, um, a freshman in high school, and I was like uh, many of many other uh, young people who go on a, a school trip to Washington, DC. Right. And so, um, so I went, went, which is not that common for people in Tennessee actually. Cause you know, it's a, it's a long drive from where I live around Nashville to DC. I, it's about 10 hours or so. But, uh, yeah, when I was a freshman in high school, we had a school trip, went to DC. Um, and of course that's one of the visits and, um, uh, uh, let's see. So I would have been 14, I guess at the time. Gotcha. All right, let me, Mike. I have a question. All right, uh, are you going to be at the uh, Aerosol Badge Award uh, reception or celebration next week? Yeah, yeah, I will. Is it next week? Yeah, I'm the twenty sure. fourth, right? No, sorry, the twenty fourth. Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. getting all, I'm getting all excited. You know. Yeah, I'll definitely be there, and uh, yeah, I'll be there, cheering you on. That's going to be Not, a good event. Nothing like the army giving you something fifty years later. <laughs> Better late than never, I guess. Amen. Okay, next question or comment. Are you aware how how many guard, tomb guards badges have been revoked? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, and I I don't think that information is anywhere online or anything. But uh, like I mentioned, and like I mentioned in our interviews, it's not something we're proud of because uh, it's a uh, it's a sad thing that happens. Uh, you know, you serve with these guys, and it's like anybody in the any anybody in the military. That you serve with you 
most of the time you get super close with them, right? Right. Yeah. And so you hate you hate to see one of your brothers go out and make a bad decision, you know, and get in trouble and uh, um, I got you get their badge revoked. So yeah. so right. the 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 nicest way I can say it is nobody sits around and counts up how many badges have been revoked because that's not cool. Good, Good for you. Next question or comment. Are there any real bodies of unknown soldiers in the tomb? Yeah, and that's one. Yeah, one thing you mentioned. Yeah, so the World War One, World War Two, and Korea War unknown soldiers, their bodies are there. Okay. Next one. Any other comments? Tom DeMiro, what are the requirements for being buried at Arlington Cemetery? All right. Yeah. Let's see. Kind of a complex question, and they they actually change it every so often. But the last this is my the last of my knowledge. Uh, this was the information. So it's anyone uh, who dies while on active duty. That's, you know, any branch. So any branch can be buried in Arlington. So die while on active duty, uh, retire from military service, or be the recipient of the Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, Prisoner of War Medal, or the Purple Heart. I believe that's all. So, so that's the requirements uh, to be buried in Arlington. Now, anyone anyone who served art honorably in the Army can be buried at any military cemetery across the country. But for Arlington National Cemetery specifically, those are the requirements. Like I said, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but if if anyone needs that, you know, 100% accurate information, definitely contact Arlington National Cemetery themselves. Gotcha. I, one very interesting point that I saw. There's a lot of children of soldiers or sailors or Marines buried in Arlington. Just the children. Yeah. So how that works is um, you are allotted one next of kin to be buried with you in Arlington. In and a separate grave. Separate grave, right? No, it, they, it's, it's in the same plot. So uh, Okay, because they got it their own headstone. Right. So what that means is that the the service member has not yet passed away. Ah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, Which okay. is pretty unfortunate, right? When you think about it, that's that's not. A yeah. Good right. Story. Yeah. Right. So what happens is, uh, if you qualify to be buried in Arlington, um, like I said, you can have one next of kin, either your spouse or a child or or what have you, can be buried with you, and it's actually in the same plot. So you have right. to let yeah. them know ahead of time. And what they do is they actually just they dig the the grave twice as deep and they stack the caskets Got anyway it. yeah if your spouse died before you but you were planning on being buried in arlington they'll go ahead and bury the spouse or the child in the case that you brought up they'll go ahead and bury the child or the spouse there in that plot and they'll make a headstone for that child or spouse and then once the service member dies, they'll bury the service member with that next of kin, and then they'll make a whole new headstone that has both names. So the right. name of the service member is on the front, and the name of the next of kin would be on the back. So I could put all my three boys in there too with me? <laughs> I, I was, I'm only kidding. I'm only yeah, kidding. I'm, I'm tracking that they only allow one other next of kin. <laughs> Who knows? That might, you know, that might change. I don't know. Okay. Well, that's a good question, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom DeMiro. Next question or comment. Has the modified facing movement has the modified has the modified facing movements and rifle handling a standard, or is there some leeway for the unit to change it for improvement over the years? All right, good question. So, the rifle manual and the the facing movements that the that you that you see done at the tomb are specific to the tomb. They're the only those those that drilling ceremony is specific to the tomb and it has changed slightly over the years um there was one time wait many many years ago i would say the 50s and 60s where they they basically did the manual and the drilling ceremony the same exact way as the rest of the army and then sometime I believe in the seventies, they started to modify it a little bit to, you know, add flair, if you will, uh, to make it a little fancier, you know? So, um, but since the seventies or eighties, I don't, 
I don't know the exact time frame, but somewhere along there, uh, they kind of made it what it is today, and it has been really similar uh, throughout all that time. There's actually a couple of pretty cool videos on YouTube. When you search YouTube, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, look at try to try finding some older videos, and you'll see that the the rifle manual and the facing movements are pretty similar. You know, over the last 40 years or so. Um, but yeah, so to answer the question, yeah, um, it's pretty much standard, but it's specific to the tomb guards. Gotcha. Thank you. Kilo, thank you. Julie Donato. Nice to see you, Ronnie. Thank you, Joe and Julie. I was happy to see the flag honoring you. Oh, and hope well. Yeah, they have uh, my family put up one of those uh, banners on the telephone poles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lo local town. That's thank cool. you for your service and all the things you continue to do for the veterans. Thank you. Julie and Joe, appreciate it. Hope you do feeling better, Joe. Got to get back dancing, though. Okay, next question. Caden Taylor, in your opinion, what was the most difficult part of being or becoming a guard? Um, let's see. The yeah, most a one, that's one part. thing. One, one thing. Hmm. <laughs> that's a good question. The most difficult yeah. part. Um. I would say just overall discipline. Becoming or being or becoming, it says. Pro becoming. Right. Because you can learn. Discipline is a learned skill, you know? Yes. Uh, so I would say discipline. And and that's pretty broad. But, uh, you know, most of the guys who, when they come to the tomb to try out and all that kind of stuff, most of the time they're kids. Like like I was 19 years old. Most of the time they're between 18 and 20. And, uh, you know, it's kind of tough for – to train a kid to be as disciplined as you need to be to be a tomb guard. Does that make sense? Yes, I'll absolutely. Explain. Yeah, okay. So, uh, it, yeah, it just, it just becoming a soldier is difficult for so yeah, many people. Yeah, true, true. And, right. uh, you know, on top of that, the discipline it takes to be a tomb guard, it's, uh, yeah, that's definitely one reason why training takes so long is uh, teaching discipline. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for that question there. All right, Kilo 19, is it ever challenging, even though you brought this up before, dealing with the spectators? Uh, you have to draw that line, right? You got to yeah. draw that line? Challenging? No. It's pretty cut and dry. Uh, you know, uh, as a guard of any type in the Army, you have your general orders and you have your special orders. And as long as you follow those orders, you should be good to go. So I would say, no, it's not challenging, uh, but it is very important to, to deal with those uh, any um, anything that might come up regarding spectators. Gotcha. All right. Tom DeMiro again, appreciate your professionalism, your professionalism in your presentation. You are one good guy, man. You're a good I, guy. Good I, I do not. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't hammer hoard one time at all. No ums or nothing. Oh, I think yeah. I don't know. I don't think I'm that good at speaking. That's one thing. What, like I mentioned, uh, when me and me, you and Matt were talking earlier before this started, uh, that video clip he played at the beginning of me giving the speech at the beginning of the changing of the guard ceremony. Badass. You, I, I you were bad, badass. No, you were badass. <laughs> I sound completely different. And uh, I was telling <laughs> exactly. Matt that uh, <laughs> it took me a long time to learn how to speak without an accent i don't think i have much of an accent you know being from tennessee but uh because this is how i mean everyone talks the same as me around me but uh, <laughs> i don't think i have much of an accent but you know when you join the army and uh you get a bunch of different people together from all parts of the country you uh as a tomb guard we tried to make everyone sound the same uh which is basically like uh what do you call it like the news anchor accent midwest accent or whatever there you go. Right. So it took me a long time to figure out how to do that, but I definitely uh, knew how to turn it on and off. <laughs> good, good. Tom, thank you so much for that uh, statement, Tom. Are oh, you airborne? How long did it take you to get the rifle inspection and the movements down, Pat? Okay, well, good question. But here's one thing I'll say. When I first started at the tomb, I was a private, a uh, private first class. So I spent the majority of my time at the tomb as a private first class and a specialist. And you, and like we mentioned, 
for those ranks, the primary duty is to guard the tomb. So I didn't have to know the rifle inspection when I was a guard. And so I got promoted to sergeant. Um, I had been there about two and a half years or so when I got promoted to sergeant. So I had literally seen that rifle inspection in front of my face hundreds, maybe thousands of times before I was actually uh, allowed to do it. So once I, once I got promoted to sergeant, I was allowed to change the guard. So I started training on how to do that. And I had, like I said, I'd seen it done so many times that it wasn't that hard for me to learn how to do it because, you know, just seeing it done so many times and uh, messing around with it, you know, uh, on my off time, I picked it up pretty quick. Sorry, it's, get, it's getting dark. Matt warned me about this. He was like, yeah, no problem. I got a okay. light. It's not very bright. Last but, question coming up. Last question. What about 100% disabled veterans at Arlington Cemetery? That's a good question. Oh, uh, I guess that question was in reference to uh, being buried at Arlington. Yeah, from Tom DeMiro. So, nice that's, day, yeah, Tom. that's a good question, and I don't have the answer. But uh, like I said, if you contact the office there at Arlington National Cemetery, they can give you the current policy and, and a definite answer. Good thing. Okay, real quick, another one. A lot of questions here. This is good. Kilo 19. Do you have practice rifles to save on the good ones? Good question. Yes. So we definitely do. We have, uh, I say we, they, uh, Us. Like I was there yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they do. They have, uh, rifles that they use for the ceremonies and then they have rifles that they only use for practice. Okay. And good. Like I mentioned in that, in that video, there's a whole, a whole lot of different stocks because you can right. swap them out. Uh, so like each relief had their own set of stocks and sometimes different reliefs have multiple sets of stocks, but, okay. and then you have a complete other complete separate rifles and complete separate stocks that they use for training. And, um, lots of training happens at nighttime. Um, cause you're on that 24 hour shift. So after the cemetery closes, uh, that's when all the training happens for the new guys and the current guys, you got a current guys got to keep training too. Last question. Okay, Kaylin Taylor. Thank you, Kaylin. How long would it take you to get ready before walking the mat? Like dressed, weapon, ready, and out the door. All right. I, I'm laughing because that's my wife. That's my beautiful wife, Kaylin. Ah. <laughs> she commented. All right. What did you say? How long did it take to get ready? Good question. All right. So. Um, Good for you, Kaylin. Uh, here's one interesting fact that not a lot of people know. Part of the training of becoming a tomb guard is uh learning how to get dressed into your uniform in under three minutes okay now that's from where you could be wearing one uniform and you getting changed into a different uniform or it could be wearing civilian clothes getting changed into your uniform the standard is three minutes and here's why the reason is is because if forever uh if ever an incident happened on the plaza out there at the tomb where a guard had to be swapped out immediately, then they created the three minute standard of once you get notified, you got three minutes to change into your uniform and be ready to go get out the door and be posted so that, um, that the tomb is still guarded. And what I'm, what I mean by, um, an, uh, a fast, uh, change might have to happen if it starts raining. So if it starts raining and you're in your, your, uh, your blouse, your dress uniform, you got to change that guard as soon as possible to get that, uh, the next guard in a raincoat. So, um, that's another reason why you have that, that three minute standard. So if it starts raining, you send the guy to go get changed into his raincoat and then they do a guard change right then to get that, uh, that guard off the plaza. Who's wearing his nice uniform. Gotcha. We had one comment. He says that rivals Superman. <laughs> Getting out, getting the cake, getting everything off. Yeah, yeah, well, Thank yeah. you so much, Jake. This is really unbelievable. Thank you so much. God bless you. Continue good service and hope to see you down the road. And we'll see you in Kentucky next week. Yeah, I'll, I can't wait to see you then. It was good to see you here. And uh, thanks for having me on. And I uh, hope somebody learned something. And, um, yeah, so I guess we're out of here, huh?
Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. You got it, sir. Thank you for watching. This is a Veterans Live show. God bless you, and welcome home.